When the winter winds began to blow, she took to draping herself in a bed blanket, huddling beside the fireplace. She carried on following at Clifford's heels until Thanksgiving Day when she was introduced to our son Kevin home for the holiday. After graduating Moody High with honors, Kevin is currently enrolled in his third year at Feeney State, majoring in chemical engineering. He's made the honor roll every semester, and there seems to be no stopping him. We love you, Kevin. <laughs> but one look at Kevin, and it was Clifford? Clifford who, as far as Kaysan was concerned? One look at our handsome son, and the shivering victim dropped her blanket and showed her true colors. She ruined our holiday dinner with her giggling coy games. She sat beside Kevin until, insisting she'd seen a spider in her chair, she moved on to his lap. You new funky master jam party mix silly fresh spider five dollar big bird. <laughs> now those of you who know Kevin understand that while he is an absolute whip at some things, he's terribly naive at others. Tall and good-looking, easy with a smile and a kind word, Kevin has been the target of many a huntress. I could barely choke down my meal and found myself counting the minutes before Kevin, the greatest joy of our lives, called an end to the private English lesson he gave Kaysan in her bedroom, got into his car, and returned to Feeney State. <laughs> He's not for you, I yelled at her. I have been criticized for yelling, told that it doesn't serve any real purpose when speaking to a foreigner, but at least it gets their attention. <laughs> Both my son and my husband are off limits as far as you're concerned. Do you understand? They are each related to you in one way or another, and that makes it wrong. Automatically wrong. Bad. Bad. Wrong. <laughs> wrong and bad. Together. <laughs> I gave up. Trying to explain moral principles to Kaysan was like reviewing a standard 1040 tax form with a house cat. <laughs> she understands only what she chooses to understand. We were approaching Christmas, December 16th, when I made the thoughtless mistake of asking her to watch the child while I ran some errands. It was nine days before Christmas, and as busy as I was, I hadn't bought a single gift. Santa, where are you? <laughs> watch the baby, I said as we stood over the crib and observed the wailing infant. I picked him up and rocked him gently as he struggled in my arms. Watch the baby. Watch baby, Kaysan responded, holding out her arms to accept him. Ugh, what a fool I was. Now, I can't account for every moment of my afternoon. Never did it occur to me that I would one day be called upon to do so, but that being the case, I will report what I remember. <laughs> I can comfortably testify that on the afternoon of December 16th, I visited the White Paw Shopping Center, where I spent a brief amount of time in the slack heap searching for a gift for Kyle, I stuck my head inside Turtleneck Crossing and searched for candles at Wax and Wayne. <laughs> there are close to a hundred shops at the White Paw Center, and you'll have to forgive me if I can't provide a detailed list of how long I spent in this or that store. I shopped till I grew wary of the time. On the way home, I stopped at the food carnival and bought a few items. It was getting dark, perhaps 4.30, when I pulled into the driveway of our home on Tiffany Circle. I collected my packages from the car and entered my home where I was immediately struck by an eerie silence. This doesn't feel right to me, I remember saying to myself. It was intuition, a mother's intuition, that unexplainable language of the senses. Something is wrong, I said to myself. Something is terribly, terribly wrong. Before calling out for Kaysan or checking on the baby, I instinctively phoned the police. <laughs> And then I stood there, stock still in the living room, staring at my shopping bags until they arrived. Twenty-seven minutes later, at the sound of the squad car in the driveway, Kaysan made an entrance, parading down the stairs in a black lace half-slip and a choker made from the cuff of Kevin's old choir robe. Where is the baby, I asked her. Where is Dawn? We combed the entire house, the officers and I, before finally finding the helpless baby in the laundry room, warm but lifeless in the dryer. The autopsy later revealed that Dawn had also been subjected to a wash cycle, hot wash, cold rinse. He died long before the spin cycle, which I suppose is the only blessing to be had in this entire ugly episode. The shock and horror that followed Dawn's death are something I would rather not recount. 
calling our children to report the news, watching the baby's body small as a loaf of bread as it was zipped into the heavy plastic bag. This image has nothing to do with the merriment of Christmas, and I hope my mention of them will not dampen your spirits at this <laughs> most special and glittery time of the year. The evening of December 16th was a very dark hour for the Dunbar family. At least with Kaysan in police custody, we could grieve privately, consoling ourselves with the belief that justice had been carried out. The bitter tears were still wet upon our faces when the police returned to Tiffany Circle, where they began their ruthless questioning of yours truly. Through the aid of an interpreter, Kaysan had spent a sleepless night at police headquarters constructing a story of unspeakable lies and betrayal. While I'm not at liberty to discuss her exact testimony, allow me to voice my disappointment that anyone, let alone the police, would even think of taking Kaysan's word over my own. How could I have placed a helpless child into the washing machine? And even if I were cruel enough to do such a thing, when would I have found the time? I was out shopping. <laughs> you may have read that our so-called neighbor, Charisse Claremont Shea, reported that she witnessed me leaving my home at around 1.15 on the afternoon of December 16th, and then 20 minutes later allegedly parked my car on the far corner of Tiffany and Papa George and, in her words, creep through her backyard and in through my basement door. Well, if the makeup she applies is any indication of her vision, then I believe it is safe to say she can't see two inches in front of her, much less testify to the identity of someone she might think she's seen crossing her yard. She's on pills. Everybody knows that. She's desperate for attention, and I might pity her under different circumstances. Cherise Claremont Shea has no more sense than a hand puppet. She has three names. <laughs> These charges, of course, are ridiculous, yet I must take them seriously as my very life may be at stake. A hearing has been set for December 27th, and knowing how disappointed you or friends might feel at being left out, I have included the time and address at the bottom of this letter. <laughs> The hearing is an opportunity during which you might convey your belated Christmas spirit through deed and action. That heartfelt concern, that desire to stand by your friends and family is the very foundation upon which we celebrate the Christmas season, isn't it? While this year's Dunbar Christmas will be seasoned with loss and sadness, we plan to proceed as best we can toward that day of days, December 27th, 1.45 p.m. at the White Paw County Courthouse, room 412. I'll be calling you to remind you of that information, and I look forward to discussing the festive bounty of your holiday season. Until that time, we wish the best to you and yours. Merry Christmas, the Dunbars. <laughs> Julia Sweeney.